Hello, I'm Katie Mediator Stover, the Director of Reader Services for the Kansas City Public Library. Welcome to the most recent entry in our series of online author events. It's becoming quite a thing these days, living and socializing online. And like many of you, there are things I miss about in-person author events here at the library. I miss getting to chat with the guests before the event. I miss shaking hands with the speakers and taking their photos. I miss seeing so many of our library friends in the audience. And yeah, I miss the wine and cheese receptions too. But there are a few side benefits. Well, you know what? There's really only one side benefit, footwear. I get to wear champagne pink glitter chucks to work now and jeans. I'm wearing them right now. So thank you so much for keeping KCPL on your social activity calendar. We're very pleased you could join us this evening for Bruce Goldfarb talking about his debut, 18 Tiny Deaths, the untold story of Francis Glessner Lee and the invention of modern forensics. If you haven't purchased a copy of 18 Tiny Deaths yet, you can help support local independent bookstores by ordering from bookshop.org. You can choose to support a specific local bookstore or the profits go into a pool that is evenly distributed among independent bookstores. You can learn more and order a copy of 18 Tiny Deaths at bookstore.org. Our guest this evening is coming to us from the Chief Medical Examiner's Office for the State of Maryland. Bruce Goldfarb is the Executive Assistant for the Chief Medical Examiner, and he gets to play with the goriest, creepiest dollhouses you've ever seen. These miniature crime scenes are part of the foundation of modern forensics, and tonight you'll hear about the person who pulled the strings behind the scenes. Before Bruce became curator of the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death, he wrote for the Baltimore Sun, Washington Post, USA Today, and American Health. I'm just listing a few of them. Tonight, Bruce sits down with us to talk about Frances Glessner Lee, the woman who devoted her fortune and much of her life to the creation of a 20th century science, modern forensics. Bruce, how did a grandmother without a college degree come to establish Harvard University's Department of Legal Medicine? And how do those tiny crime scenes fit in? Hi, Katie, how are you? Um, it's really, nice. it, this is so awesome. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's such a thrill. And I'm talking about one of the, my favorite subjects ever. Um, how did she get, how did she establish the field of forensic science? Um, by, by the force of her personality and spending a lot of money. Um, but she was, uh, you know, genuinely the mother of forensic science. She was, a, a really a pivotal figure uh, and an agent of change in uh, the mid 20th century. And a lot of everything that we've come to know in a CSI type crime scene investigation uh, is attributable to Frances Glessner Lee and the program that she established at Harvard University. What is it about her, her childhood that led her down this path? Well, you know, she had a, uh, a remarkable uh, upbringing. Her parents were quite wealthy. I think we have some pictures, but she grew up in Chicago, uh, born in 1878. Uh, her dad owned an agricultural machinery company that became part of International Harvesters. So they were really quite wealthy. Um, this is her playhouse that was uh, on, the, they had a summer getaway in the uh, White Mountains of New Hampshire, um, their summer home um that they called the rocks and and this ended up being around uh, 1500 acres and 20 buildings and a full-time staff of around 80 people and uh, this is the playhouse that was uh designed and built for her by isaac scott the craftsman and artist that was a friend of the family so she she uh come, came of age in the gilded age chicago and um, she and her brother both were homeschooled uh, in Chicago and tutored in um, the, the classics and languages and literature and the natural sciences and mathematics and music. And um, this is the home in Chicago where they grew up, uh, the Prairie Avenue mansion that was designed by H.H. H. Richardson. Um, and there's the, they had their own classroom inside the house that was uh, uh, where, they, uh, where they learned every day. And, you know, when she, um, by the time she had reached age, uh, she came of age, 1819, uh, 
she had been equipped with a, um, this is their, their, uh, their school room. Um, the previous picture is her mom and dad. Um, but uh, she had been equipped with the, you know, extraordinary education and she was um, a, a voracious reader and she spoke many languages and uh, both she and her brother, um, you know, musicians and uh, skilled in arts and, and all these things. So, you know, I think that um, unfortunately for a woman of you know, affluence uh, uh, at that time, there weren't a lot of career paths. She wasn't expected to work outside the house. Um, I mean, there weren't a whole lot of jobs for women uh, as it was, you know, some household staff or clerical uh, or that sort of thing. But, um, you know, there weren't a lot of women in the professions. And um, I think that she felt really not challenged enough. And I, I think that she felt uh, unfulfilled uh, ultimately. Could she have gone into a profession or gone to college if she wanted to? She could have, she, yes. Yes, she could have. Um, uh, certainly she was strong headed enough and determined enough that she could have done anything that she wanted to. Um, she could have gone to medical school. You read online that, you know, she said that she would have liked to have been a doctor or a nurse or something like that. But the fact is uh, that uh, even, you know, she said herself, there's only one thing um, that, that she wanted and that was to attend uh, Harvard Medical School. And it was Harvard or nothing. Everybody, uh, all the people who were important in her life went to Harvard. Uh, her brother, George Burgess McGrath, H.H. Uh, Richardson, um, her husband, Blewett Lee, all, they're all Harvard men. Uh, and, and it was Harvard or nothing. And unfortunately, Harvard didn't admit women as students until 1945, so that was out. Um, but she had a relationship with Harvard anyway, aside from friends and her brother attending Harvard. She really had an affection for this school that she could never attend. She did. And that was a, uh, a very complicated relationship that, that she had uh, through her introduction to forensic science or what was then called legal medicine was through a family friend, uh, a doctor who um, went to Harvard Medical School uh, by the name of George Burgess McGrath. And uh, McGrath was a pathologist who um, was appointed uh, medical examiner for Suffolk County, uh, Massachusetts, which includes most of Boston. And uh, Francis began uh, financially supporting McGrath's work at Harvard and uh, the lectures that he was doing. And she started doing that in 1931. So she became very close with uh, McGrath and she was married. Was there any suspicion that they were carrying on some sort of affair or what, what is it about McGrath that, that just, that made her spark intellectually? I, I, you know, I, and I've read, I've read a lot of correspondence and things between them. And, and I've read a lot of Francis Glessner Lee talking about uh, Dr. McGrath, um, personal correspondence and these sorts of things. And the overall sense that I get out of this, and although I couldn't say so in the book, you know, I, I, I believe that um, George Burgess McGrath was, was probably gay. Um, I don't think that there is any romantic relationship between them. Uh, I think that they were they're quite affectionate. Um, she cared for him deeply. Uh, they both, they're, they're very uh, uh, close friends. Um, but even in private, um, they never, some of the stuff is almost, almost borderline flirtatious. Um, but, um, you know, there's a, there's no evidence that it was anything other than, uh, you know, an affectionate close friendship. Um, and even in private, they never used terms of endearment that, that he was always Dr. McGrath to her and she was always Mrs. G Lee to him. Um, so, um, and I don't think that, um, she never uh, expressed, uh, any, uh, romantic uh, interest in, in, 
in really in him or anybody else for that matter uh, in her life. I think that they were both very comfortable with each other. And I, I've known people, and maybe you've known people who are, um, who are, you see, you see some people and they seem so comfortable and close with one another and you kind of, you know, are they a couple or are they, or, you know, and I think it may have been something like that where they're just very, very, very good friends, um, but not, not in a romantic way. Can you talk a little I could bit? Be about wrong. I could be wrong. <laughs> my impression. I could be wrong. Can you talk a little bit about how McGrath got Francis interested in medical in, in medical examination in in the coroner? In, in legal medicine. In legal in legal medicine. The actual anecdote, what happened that that flipped her switch? Yeah. Um, that that story. Um, well. Uh, McGrath and Francis, which is, you know, finding that morsel, uh, the story that I'm going to tell, was to me one of the greatest things and, and one of the most surprising, unexpected things in the whole project that just absolutely delighted me uh, and just made everything just so perfect. People always wondered, what happened? you know, was, uh, you know, was she avenging somebody's murder? Uh, was she seeking justice or something like that? And no, no, it's even weirder and it's even it's even better than that. But uh, in 1929, Francis Glesner Lee had to have some medical treatment. Um, and so she was hospitalized in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, as it happened, so was Dr. McGrath. He had cellulitis in both hands, which is a very serious condition. Um, and um, uh, just the bad inflammation, it could it could result in amputation. It's really quite serious. And so uh, they spent an extended period of time in, uh, convalescing uh, at this uh, facility, their private facility called Phillips House. Um, and over the summer of 1929, Frances was pretty much in a low point in her life. Um, uh, she had been running a an antique shop with her daughter, which had closed when her daughter got married. Her brother had just died, um, her only sibling, and um, she was having these medical problems. And she was just in a really, really dark place at the time. And that summer, she's spending time with uh, George Burgess McGrath and um, uh, probably one of the, you know, her oldest friends and that existed that she'd known since she was a teenager. They went to the 1893 World's Fair together, uh, the exhibition in Chicago. And uh, they're spending time in, in the summer of 1929. And they're talking about all kinds of stuff. They have hours and hours and hours to kill. And uh, he told her about the coroner system and medical examiners and explained all this um, and, and what, his, what he was doing. He talked about his work, which she found endlessly fascinating. Uh, he was involved in all these cases, the uh, 1919 molasses disaster and the Sacco and Vanzetti case and, and these sorts of things. So he was a, just an amazing storyteller. Uh, but what actually got her going, weirdly enough, is uh, they're sitting there and talking one day and McGrath says this, this offhand thing, just, he just remarks, uh, he said, you know, I've always thought that the organs of the human body are the most decorative objects in the world and are really worthy of, you know, being depicted as treated as art and being hung in maybe a, a doctor's office or something like that. And she goes, ding, that's, that's a really cool idea. And she went on this uh, extraordinary uh, journey and she spent years, she said years and years and years going to libraries and learning about um, ancient cultures and burial practices and the theories of color and gems and botany and anatomy and physiology and all these things. And she ended up writing a, a manuscript around 400 pages long um, to prove that Dr. McGrath was correct, that the, that the internal organs of the human body are beautiful. Um, and she did that, but along the way, ended up establishing the Department of Legal Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, but what got all, everything going and changed the course of her life was this little offhand remark about the beauty of the internal organs of the human body. 
makes me wonder if she would have become an investigator or a doctor or or a or an academic if given the chance what what her inclination would have been yeah i wonder i i, I don't know um you know she could have uh, had she had the opportunity, uh, would she have gone to medical school? And if she did, uh, would she have done, I mean, maybe she would have done great things, but she wouldn't have done what she did. You know, we wouldn't have legal medicine. Uh, I don't think things would have happened the way they did unless they happened the way they did. She, uh, she had a pretty, uh, fraught relationship with Harvard too. I mean, she, did they entertain her notions because she was very smart and knew what she was talking about or because she was pretty wealthy for a woman of that of that era yeah she she and harvard had a complicated relationship it was they were both exploiting each other <laughs> um and that was pretty clear harvard saw her as a, a donor and that she had dangled uh, the prospect of a million dollars in her, uh, and this is a million dollars back when a million dollars really counted for something. Uh, in 1930, what is it, 37 or so, she gave the equivalent of, um, it was around a quarter million dollars then, but the value that was equivalent to around uh, $3.8 million to establish the Department of Legal Medicine. Um, and also spent equally uh, as much uh, on the nutshells in the homicide seminar. I mean, she spent millions and millions and millions, um, but she had promised that, um, you know, if if you'll indulge, you know, if you all these requests and do the things that she wants, that um, when she leaves this board of coil, there'll be a million dollars in it for Harvard. Uh, and, and they, you know, through her, the promises of, of money and uh, gifts and, you know, being a very persuasive person, um, you know, she got Harvard to do her way. And it was important to, that it be done at Harvard because Harvard had the prestige. Uh, and that was very important that it be, you know, regarded as something, uh, you know, legitimate and um, elite. Well, I think we should start moving into the nutshells. I'm really interested in how did Francis get involved or get the idea to create these mini crime scenes? Where did the ideas for them come from? And are there answers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the nutshell studies, uh, and we're in this room here, I can show you around. Uh, these are, I gotta turn the lights back on because the, I got to put another nickel on the meter because uh, it's on a timer switch. Um, but these are the nutshell studies of unexplained death. And this room is actually a classroom. It's not a gallery. It looks like a gallery. But uh, what happens is um, uh, these are used in the homicide seminar. There was a picture uh, back there. But Francis's um, what she, she came to realize that there were three things that were needed to move away from the coroner system and adopt the medical examiner system. Um, and the one thing you have to do is to address the manpower. You need to train doctors to be medical examiners, train them in forensic pathology. So see, she established this program at Harvard Medical School. Uh, the, another thing you need is to reform laws. You need to change laws to abolish the coroner system and adopt the medical examiner system and places that have a medical examiner, you need to uh, reinforce the laws to give them greater, you need to reform them, give them more uh, autonomy, independence, to shield them from pol political influence, to get them in charge of an investigation. So some places uh, the medical examiner had to be ordered to by the district attorney or something like that. So uh, the problem was that they're getting involved too, uh, too late in the process. And the third piece was to train the police. Uh, and, you know, arguably, you know, the, the most important piece because uh, everything begins at the death scene. Um, the police are the first responders uh, and they are the ones who go to the death scene. Uh, sometimes they're the only people at the death scene and uh, the police at the time were not well trained. They would, uh, they just for lack of not knowing any better, they would uh, pick up a weapon or move the body or walk through blood. 
um, a lot of times it wasn't really apparent what happened. Somebody would be found injured and they would take them to the emergency ward or if they were dead, they just go to the undertaker and it's not until sometime later, hours or a day or two later, and somebody says, maybe the, maybe the doc should take a look at the body. What do you think? And by then, it, all the evidence, it's all gone. It's all been compromised. So she began this homicide, the homicide seminar. There was a picture uh, a couple of pictures ago of the, of the seminar, the table full of men sitting there. Um, and um, uh, this is a week long seminar uh, in homicide investigation. And it was the first of its kind and to train police officers in forensic science. Uh, and uh, uh, this began in 1945. Uh, it still goes on today. Uh, it's held here in this building. Um, but uh, the curriculum has changed very little. Uh, but you teach them about sharp force injuries and blunt force injuries, and you teach them about hangings and strang strangulations and drownings, and they observe an autopsy and all these things. But you know, how do you practice looking at a crime scene uh, unless you're actually looking at a crime scene? So um, you know, that's what these are. They're a just a, a practice. Um, they're not meant to be solved. There are answers, okay? There is a file folder with solutions, but the solutions that you are not what you think. Um, they're not uh, puzzles to be solved or who done. Let me switch the camera around so you can see these things better. But they're really not the uh, uh, puzzles to be solved or who done it. Um, uh, but let me start uh, by showing you what we have here. Uh, this is the most complicated one. Uh, it's called three room dwelling. Yeah. Um, that story. Um, well, uh, going on. Are you there? Hey Bruce, it was a. Oh. I'm sorry, Bruce. There was a technical difficulty on our end. Oh, okay. But we're all good. Yes, we're all good. All right, good. Uh, so yes, so um, uh, there's 18 of them here, uh, and um, they are uh, uh, when when officers are assigned to the dioramas, uh, they're in a group, um, and they generally spend um, you know a couple of hours to. Uh, look at it uh, in front of the cabinet, there's sort of sketchy um, uh, information that you're told. This says that uh, there's even Wallace, he's a local farmer, he's found dead. Uh, he was a quarrelsome uh, man, unpleasant, uh, and uh, to uh, he would uh, threaten to hang himself. Um, and that was the way he would intimidate his wife and you did that to manipulate her. Uh, now, usually, he would stand on that bucket there that's along the side. But on this day, uh, the wife had the bucket there over on the water pump. And so he stood on this crate instead, which apparently couldn't hold his weight. And now he's dead. So that's what you're left with is to figure out what may have gone on here. Um, sometimes things aren't as simple as they seem. Sometimes they are. Uh, this one is called, I didn't bring my key with me. I could have opened the cabinets. But I can turn out this light. They look better. This is called living room. And this has a little dish of matches and rolled cigarettes there over in the ashtray. If you look down, I don't know if I can get it. There's knitting as she did with straight pins. Bruce, I have a question about the titles of the nutshells. She named them after rooms or scenes. Were there any names for the the people in the nutshells or any oh, other information? Oh yeah, this is Ruby Davis. Wait a minute, no, the neighbor is. Um, this is, uh, it says what the victim's name is. She made up names. Um, what's this person's name? What's it say? Oh, Ruby Davis. Oh, she's a housewife. Oh, that's right. Right, right, right. She's found in the stairs. Um, yeah, they have names. This is red bedroom. It's just beautiful, beautiful. I don't know if you can see out the window there, but 
Um, it actually shows, I can't adjust it. There's a whole neighborhood next door. She's got the facades of the house. Trigger warning, this is simulated violence. Just in case anybody might be disturbed by dolls. This one is called Saloon and Jail. And this guy is found here in front of a bar. Um, however, has what it takes. But he's dead here in front of a bar. Uh, there's a banana peel. I like that. There's also a brick over there. Uh, he may have been in there. But the next morning, he's found here in jail. Poor guy. Bruce, can you talk a little bit about the materials Francis would use? Because she didn't skimp on any of the creation of these nutshells. She was no, very detail-oriented. She was very resourceful. And the amazing thing is the bulk of these were done between 1943 and 1948. So it was during wartime. This one is just beautiful. The background, the box, uh, box factory sign, is just is really ingenious. Um, and um, when the detail is like the worn spot on the wall from the back of the chair, uh, there are just so many great details. So yeah, a lot of this was was handmade. Um, and, uh, you know, miniatures and models were much more of a thing back then. And the problem that she encountered was that the products that were available uh, were too fine. They were too nice. And it was very difficult for her to find objects that looked used, um, things that were broken. This one's called... Um, uh, Woodsman Shay. And, uh, you know, this is obviously some uh, very marginalized people. There's a lot of alcohol. Um, and so uh, it was really, really difficult. And they ended up having to make it because it was easier to make it than to acquire it. So a lot of the furniture was purchased. Um, she did um, some putty, she used experts for various parts of it. So, um, uh, she had a carpenter doing the framing, um, some of the, like that pitcher and uh, the uh, bowl, um, that was acquired. She just would buy that. Um, but uh, a lot of it had to be made. Um, this is uh, all this correspondence um, written, I'm pretty sure, with a cat's whisker, um, how to get the handwriting that small. Uh, and it's usually what's done to do that. I don't know if she did it in that case, but um, so yeah, she would acquire some things, but now all of the, the figures, for example, uh, none of them are off the shelf. They had to be custom made because she couldn't find uh, all the figures for dollhouses had a base. So they stood upright uh, and they were cartoonish and not realistic. So she had to make these uh, from pieces and all the clothing, all the fabric, all the detail work, uh, that was her strength. That was her background was in the needlework. Um, and so she did that herself. This one. Did she have any other assistants making these crime scenes? Uh, I, when you say assistants, um, all, the fabric, there's, I don't see where she purchased any fabric. She purchased items like, um, I have to turn the light back on for three room dwelling. I mean, this is a good example of a whole variety uh, a lot of things are acquired. The refrigerator is plastic. That phone, that clock uh, is plastic. Uh, and the radio um, and the table settings, all those things are purchased. But the chairs were made. Um, those are fabricated. Over here on um, the sink, um, I wish the, uh, the cabinet were not here, but you can see here uh, in the sink, um, that's draining the sink. I don't know if you can see the how the appliances are plugged in, um, but they look like they have electrical plugs. Now, if you look uh, hanging beneath the sink, uh, way up under the cupboards, see there's that there's a sieve with the red handle, and next to it there's a hand mixer. Do you see it? I can't. I don't know if I can zoom in or can I zoom? Oh, there it is. There, look at that. I can see it. It makes me want to just put my face right up to the camera, and that's not going to make it any closer. Oh, look at the electrical plugs. I mean, these are just so nice. 
the water taps, right? But that hand mixer, that's a charm bracelet charm. That's made out of gold. Oh my goodness. I know. Yeah. So just to have a little doodad, one little doodad hanging beneath there, that's a charm bracelet charm um, on top of the stove. Whoops. What did I do? Wow. Does that look familiar? That's a Monopoly piece. That is. <laughs> yeah. Do not pass go. She That's really means it. it. Yeah. So there's that. What was the other thing that was really amusing in here? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, oh, the newspaper. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So she had these newspapers made. Are they Batavia the real Illinois. deal? Of course they are. That's from Batavia, Illinois. That's the Batavia Herald that she, I, I, the, the lengths that she went to just to find the paper to print this on. Because it can't be newsprint, newsprint crumbles. It can't be regular paper because it's too thick and not, not plausible for newspaper. So she had to find something that was thin that would not crumble and fade, and she did. She found it. It's sort of like an onion skin, but it's not coated. But it's a very thin paper, um, and she wrote to the newspapers. It's an actual front page of the paper that she had photographically reduced and made into a printing block for a single impression. That was it. Just to have one little thing that's there in the room, just as you know, trash on the floor. Had to have it. Bruce, um, the, the audience questions are rolling in and there's one okay. that's pretty significant for right now. And someone wants to know, wouldn't it have been easier for study with photographs the way we do today? Photography was available at the time. <clears throat> yeah, no. Um, I, I mean, there, there, there are shortcomings. Uh, to do it with, with photography, and they still, you can do it with photography today. You can photograph a crime scene, um, but what you do is you focus the camera on that thing that you want the person to see, um, and particularly with the resolution of the cameras that they uh, that they had at the time. So it's not really satisfactory. You'd be spoon feeding it to somebody. Uh, you've um, you know you play these video games and you're in a room and whatever it is, but you roll your mouse over the objects and one of them lights up. This is the one that's clickable. So you know what it is basically you're supposed to do. Uh, and, and that's really quite different. You can photograph evidence. Here's what a blood stain looks like. Uh, but that's very different than showing somebody a scene and saying, you know, find the evidence. Uh, it's in there, you know, that's a very different situation. Um, there is a blood spatter in there, find it, you know? So uh, it's a very, very different exercise. Um, Are these models still used today? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they, they, the seminar is held in the conference room across the hall and the dioramas are still used and they're still used in the way that they were intended uh, the same way for the same purpose. We had someone ask if these models have ever been used in a court of law. No. No. And they, but they have been on, they have been exhibited to the public. They had, I'm trying to reverse the camera so you can see me again. There I go. Um, they had one and only public exhibition uh, a couple of years ago at the end of 2017 from October, 2017 to January of 2018 at the uh, American Art Museum Renwick Gallery in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was really tremendous. They, they went on an exhibit and about 100,000 people went to see them. It was the second most popular exhibit in the History Museum up until that time. And there was some concern with the restoration of the nutshells, getting them ready for the exhibit. Yeah. Uh, I do remember hearing a curator talk about uh, a curator talk that she couldn't be sure what she could 
repair or replace or what had been moved maybe it, over the yeah. years because yeah. that could have she could alter a crime scene that was a concern and so um i was i was assigned to uh, accompany them at all times i was here the work for the for the the conservation was done in this room in this room and in the room next door but they did the the bulk of the work was done here before they were even moved they had to be uh, uh, repaired and strengthened and those sorts of things. So they did the work here, uh, starting with those big ones in the middle. Um, and um, there, there's a lot of very subtle things. Um, a, as you say, you know, something could be a, uh, a piece of dirt or it could be something more significant. So, you know, everything, every, anytime there is a question, you know, they call me over and, you know, is this supposed to be like this? Does this mean something? Um, and another thing that the Smithsonian is very, very good at, they're, they're relentless researchers, um, but um, they, they found every photo of the dioramas that existed. And by comparing uh, different photos from different time periods and other evidence, they were able to uh, reconstruct uh, and put things back to the way they were supposed to be. I can give you a couple examples. Um, there are some old photos that reverse the victim in this bed. And at some point she had him over here. Uh, and these two, these two guys were reversed for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but we decided to leave it, or they decided to leave it as it is. Um, uh, since this is the way that they've been for the, for the uh, last several decades. Uh, this stick, it's a little thing, it's a little, little thing, but that stick at some point had been removed. Uh, and this piece of wood was over here and this door and that stick had been thrown inside. But when they were examining everything and they go over with ultraviolet light, uh, they found, uh, you can barely see it, but there's a little dot of adhesive that keeps that in place. But they, by looking with ultraviolet light, they could match up exactly where the ends of the stick were glued. Uh, and that stick is in, this is exactly the way it was in the old photos. Um, and that's the way, so they restored it to, to that condition. Uh, this one, uh, this has always bothered me because the pardon to victims here, it's upsetting because this chair is knocked over and it looks like a struggle which there may or may not have. Uh, it, th these things are they're very, very confusing uh, because um, I've always been bothered by uh, those, uh, these two chairs that are knocked over there. And I, I just presumed that these things fell over from being moved over the years. But when the case was off and uh, we were able to, they, uh, the conservator very uh, carefully touched these things those chairs are actually secured in position. There's a thread that holds them there. And that thread goes all the way through the whole uh, dresser. So that drawer is fixed in that position. It's intended to be open exactly like that because there's a thread that keeps that you can't open it any, you can't pull it out or push it back. It's, it's fixed in that spot. And those chairs are fixed in that spot. So that she intended those to be that way. But this chair is knocked over and I've always been tempted to uh, turn it upright. Um, in this picture, that's uh, Ralph Mosier, who was her carpenter. Uh, and in this picture, you can hardly see it here, but that's the bedroom from three room dwelling. And that chair is upright and it's sitting over there, but it's clearly upright in this picture and it's knocked down over here. And there's nothing that keeps that knocked down. That chair could be upright, um, but at this point, I don't dare make that change because it's been like that for 30 years or whatever, how long, however long it's been. So, of course, it's safe to say that no one knows more about these nutshells than you do, but can you tell us what happened to the nutshell that was destroyed? Are there any photos that remain? Uh, no photos that remain. That's, uh, I, I don't know. The ninth, there, there, there were 19 that were here. Uh, and and the, there was one called uh, Two Rooms. Um, and, uh, there was a, a, a gentleman who's in his living room. Um, was he cleaning a gun? He was doing something. 
I forget what it was, pouring a drink or whatever, a coffee, I forget, um, shot dead in his living room. Uh, so there's a, uh, there is a before and an after. There's a, a photo with him before he shot, and then there's a photo of him after a police officer has arrived and helpfully helped his wife place him on the couch instead of pick him up off the floor, uh, move the body. And there's 30 differences between the before and the after You're supposed to identify all these things. And I've heard variously that it, that it may have gotten crushed or damaged, or something very bad happened to it. Why the pieces um, were not kept, I don't know. But uh, when, when they were housed here um, from uh, 1968, um, everything that was in that building, that's the old building, every, anything that was in that building would be here. I have very, very thoroughly searched. Uh, and there's no trace of it. There's no trace of it or any photos or any other evidence that it was ever here. So that was two chiefs ago. Um, nobody who was around then, I, there's nobody to ask, no way to find out what happened or anything like that. We've had a request from the audience. Could you walk us through one of the scenes and show us how it might be used to solve a crime? No, can't give you the answers. Um, <laughs> But I'll walk you through one, okay? Test us. You can test us. I, yeah, um, I I really don't want to give away too much uh, <laughs> because these things are used for teaching purposes. Um, but I, I wish I had my key with me. Um, but uh, this one, uh, first of all, here's what it says. It's called living room, and it's reported to Nutshell Laboratories, Friday, May twenty second, nineteen forty one. Mrs. Ruby Davis, a housewife, was discovered dead on the stairs by her husband, Reginald Davis. Mr. Davis was questioned and gave the following statement. He and his wife had spent the previous evening, Thursday, May 21st, 1941, quietly at home. His wife had gone upstairs to bed shortly before he had. This morning, he awoke a little before five o'clock to find that his wife was not beside him in bed. After waiting a while, he got up to see where she was and found her dead body on the stairs. He at once called the family physician who upon his arrival immediately notified the police. The model shows the premises just before the arrival of the family physician. All right, so that's what he says. And let me turn the light out so you can see this clearly. So that's what he says. There's a poor woman on the stairs. So we're looking for clues. Okay, audience, we're looking for clues. Or anything, or what is, does that, does that say anything to you? I mean, what, not just clues, but, you know, sort of state of mind and who these people are. I, when I look at that corner, when I look at that overflowing ashtray. Those are, yeah, those are cigarette butts on the, on the side table, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, they are. And the newspaper yeah. is just, it's out of. It's a it's you know, a jumbled mess. One thing just occurred to me. It just dawned on me. If I did that at home, what would my wife say? Oh yeah. So we're thinking about psychology too at the same it time. Just dawned on me. That's a slobby thing. I mean, the house is very neat, really very neat and tidy. Right. If my, if if I was sitting there, first of all, it always looked like desperation to me. I mean, just I don't know, just the whole scene with the overflowing ashtray. Uh, but that to me, it just bothers me. For one, it's overflowing. Um, it looks like somebody sat there a long time and just you know, cigarette after cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. But it just dawned on me, you know. A guy would not do that unless he was certain 
that nobody's going to yell at him for doing that. <laughs> I wonder. I don't know. I don't know. Unless, there, don't know. unless it was a tense situation Could that be. made that person smoke like that. Oh my gosh, there's a real book on the side table there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, the books have the, the books open up and um they have pages and everything, yeah. Yeah. Just like uh we've had audience question about um what? Francis's children. What? Oh my goodness. <laughs> no. A tiny 18 tiny deaths. What? Where's the other know where the camera is? What? Oh, look at that. Isn't that adorable? So, Francis's children, what about them? Yes. Were you able to interview her children? No, her children are long gone. Um, her, I, her grandchildren. I knew her, uh, I, well, her grandson um, passed away uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but uh, she has one granddaughter uh, who is surviving. Uh, Percy, um, uh, I've, I've spoken to her. I, I didn't interview family for the book because um, they're so far removed, really, uh, from the, the, the events of, of that time. So um, uh, I, I was more interested in contemporaneous materials and sources. We had uh, another question about the nutshells. Someone wanted to know, is there any is there any clues in those nutshells that would really give a viewer a close idea to what it is that happened? Sort of a piece of evidence that broke open a case. Yeah, these are not meant to be solved. It's not about, <laughs> it's, this is an irresistible urge. Irresistible. <laughs> I showed you this one, you know, it's not about that. Let me show you this one. And this guy, and he's even Wallace, and he's hanging here from a rope. And it says here that this is reported in Nutshell Laboratory, Saturday, July 15th, 1939. Even Wallace, a local farmer, was found dead by his wife, Imelda. Mrs. Imelda Wallace was questioned and gave the following statement. Mr. Wallace was hard to get along with. For some reason, a lot of the men in these dioramas are hard to get along with. I don't know what that's all about, but in any event, he was hard to get along with. When things didn't go the way he wanted, he'd go out to the barn threatening suicide. Mr. Wallace would stand up on a bucket and put a noose around his neck, but she would always manage to persuade him not to do it. On the afternoon of July 14th, around four o'clock, they had a dispute and Mr. Mollis made his usual threats, but she didn't follow him to the barn right away. When she did go to the barn, she found the premises as represented in the model. The bucket usually stood on the corner just inside the barn door, but yesterday she used it and she left it out by the pump. The rope was always kept fastened to the beam the way it was found. It was just part of the regular barn hoist. So. He would, he was a manipulative, quarrelsome guy and would threaten her, you know, to take his life if they get less to get his way. And there's the bucket that he usually stood on. But on this day, he stood on that crate, which apparently couldn't hold his weight or it could have been cut. I don't know, but uh, it fell through it. So, you know, it's not a whole lot of question about, I mean, either he did it or his wife did it. You know, I mean, it's really, there's not a whole lot of mystery here. It's really the question is, you know, what's going on here? Is it really what it looks like? Is the, are things making sense? So uh, in the in the case of this one with the living room, for example, um, you know, everything, uh, everything has to make sense. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, and this is, I, I'm not gonna even tell you which ones. Um, some homicides are often staged to uh, uh, look like an accident or a suicide, just to, you know, it's the nature of wanting to come cover up a crime or suicides are staged to look like an accident or homicide. So somebody collects the insurance money. So, uh, some of these are staged and your task is to see if, 
you know, that the, the takeaway is really just that things aren't adding up. There's an inconsistency between what you're being told uh, and, and what you see. Um, so uh, this one, for example, which we were talking about earlier, um, which is the hideaway, and this Mr. Uh, Arthur Roberts is inside there, uh, and he was married, and uh, he was uh, meeting here with Mrs. Marion Chase, who's also married, and they got together here and this afternoon, uh, and he was going to tell her that the affair was over, uh, over and done. So uh, he's standing at the foot of the bunk bed and goes to uh, reach in his pocket to uh, pick up a cigarette uh, and uh, get his pack of cigarettes, and, and uh, a cigarette dropped. And as he uh, leaned over to pick up the cigarette, the gun fell out of his pocket and uh, discharged and um, um, shot him. Uh, and so uh, you can see there over his left shoulder, there is a blood stain. Um, so that's what you're left with. So there's only two people here. Uh, and really the question is, what happened here? Uh, could she, you know, the, the girlfriend said that uh, the gun dropped discharged, killed him, um, and that's it. However, she picked up the gun, which is a convenient way of explaining her why her fingerprints are on it. She picked it up and threw it down and then left the premises. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what you're left with. Now, if you spend several hours looking at this, straining your eyes, and I mean hours, you may find projectile. And if you find the projectile, figuring that trajectory will give you your answer. So <laughs> that's what you're left with. Um, Bruce, um, come back to that one because there's an interesting fact about that nutshell. Oh, yes. yes. That's a, this, tell us how that nutshell in particular ties to Francis. Well, this is inspired by uh, the Playhouse. Uh, that was at the rocks that was designed and built by Isaac Scott, but that's uh, pretty clearly inspired by her childhood playhouse, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really very nice. Can you tell us what Frances um, did in her playhouse? That was not just a playhouse kind of uh, facility on her parents' estate. That was, she studied and learned things in there, didn't she? Oh, yeah. yeah, well, it was, it was a, she had a playhouse a two room playhouse with a working kitchen. She had a wood stove and actually used the wood stove. It was her job to make the jams and jellies for the family for the season. And she would also make uh, curatives um, for neighbors when she would accompany the doctors on the rounds. Uh, but, you know, she'd do full, you know, full meals and, and that little wood stove in her kitchen. And uh, in the winter times, her brother and uh, his friends would uh, trudge up to uh, the rocks and the snow and they would uh, her playhouse was the only uh, building that was uh, had any heat in the winter time so they would uh, they would hang out there but yeah that playhouse got a lot of use over the years and um i believe it still exists um the uh, the there it is that playhouse um and then i believe it escaped the fire and is still on the property at the rocks Bruce, is it possible for the public to see these miniatures once we can all travel again? Um, not. Are you going to put me on the spot, aren't you? Um, <laughs> That's an audience question. I am not putting you on the spot. <laughs> they're not generally open to the public. Um, it's really difficult to accommodate. Um, we are, these, the dioramas are on uh, Atlas Obscura and those sorts of things. And occasionally we have uh, people who, oops, who just come in off the street um, and it gets really, really difficult to, um, um, you know, to drop things at a moment's notice and spend another hour in this room and that sort of thing. And, and it just, it's really, really difficult to accommodate. I do try you know, we've we've gone, we've done so much to make these things accessible uh, by various ways. And there are documentaries, there's a coffee table picture book, they've been on public exhibition, there's tons of photos uh, online, uh, but we it's just not possible to accommodate everybody who would like to see the dioramas, unfortunately. So uh, we really have to restrict um, access to, uh, you know, 
I, I, so no, the short answer is not open to the general public. No. <laughs> if there's, you know, a special request, I, you know, I have had people come in from overseas, um, artists, photographers, um, there was a, a, a miniaturist uh, artist. Uh, she's not a miniature artist. She actually is a full size person, but she works in miniatures um, and uh, named uh, 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 Lee Harper in Oxford, Mississippi. And this was a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, and she had been inspired by Francis Bessner Lee's work. And so, you know, I, I felt it was so lucky that she got in before the, uh, uh, the, all the pandemic and everything emerged and, and uh, she was able to get in and spend some time with them, but it's really difficult to accommodate the members of the general public, the taxpayer, I, you know, I just, so you understand that the, the citizens of Maryland don't pay me to be a museum guide. That's not why, uh, you know, I am, you know, uh, get paid by the taxpayer. It is to work for the medical examiner's office. And it's only as, you know, as I can, accommodate well, all the rest of this stuff is um you know that's not what i'm here for there's got to be so much material you couldn't include in this book can you tell us something about francis that didn't make the book that maybe it broke your heart to have to leave out that re research there's always research that breaks the author's heart they have to leave it out but what what can you tell us about francis that didn't make it into the book I'm thinking of a couple things. Um, there was one, there was, there was one, uh, there was a couple of things. Uh, one I've never told anybody, um, but um, there, there was another anecdote. She did make a gift of, she was very, very shrewd. She was just really shrewd. Um, and um, she had a very valuable violin, not a study of Various, but something equal to it. It was extremely valuable, worth tens of thousands of dollars in the 1930s and when she had it. And um, I, I wanted to keep this anecdote in, but uh, she she was considering this violin, um, which I believe had been valued around what was it? It was between twenty and thirty thousand dollars, which is a substantial amount of money in the 1930s. Um, and uh, she had loaned it to the violinist. Um, of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And um, she was considering, I think she had it uh, valued. Um, there was a funny newspaper article from the Chicago, one of the Chicago papers, uh, as an as a, as a amusing feature story. Uh, they went to pawn shops and tried to pawn it to see how much they could get for it. And, you know, guys were offering them like 10 bucks for this $20,000 instrument. You know, just to, but, you know, so she, she approached Harvard and she says, you know, I've got this really valuable violin. I'm just thinking, you know, maybe, you know, it could be of, of interest to Harvard Medical School um, and uh, considering giving it to you. But bear in mind um, that it's being used by a musician with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, um, and it's his main instrument, and he really, really depends on it um, for his uh, performances. But I leave it up to you and, and just whatever you think you know, it might be best. Um, and Harvard says, yeah, 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 we'll take the violin. Sure. Yeah, we'll take it. And she ended up not giving it to him, but they didn't, they didn't hesitate a minute, you know, to take this violin, this extraordinary violin away from a musician who's actually using it, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But uh, they thought that that was, um, you know, with the piano story and, and things like that, that the, the essence of her personality um, and her shrewdness. And I, I think it was a bit of a manipulation um, was sufficient, but I, I did like that story. The other one, I, I don't know if I want to get into it. <laughs> well, then I will ask you to tell us, and we'll close out the hour with this question. How did the Nutshells make it to Baltimore when Francis had so much love for Harvard? Yeah. Um, when she died in 1962, Harvard Medical School lost all interest in the Department of Legal Medicine, uh, the seminars for police. They especially didn't want to have uh, cops on the Harvard campus. Uh, and they could not wait just to wash their hands of the whole thing. And so um, uh, they pulled the plug on the Department of Legal Medicine 
And the, the person who was the chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland at the time, his name was Dr. Russell Fisher. And Russell Fisher had uh, was a graduate. He was a research uh, a Harvard uh, fellow in legal medicine at Harvard. He was one of their first uh, graduates. Uh, and so he was trained at Harvard and uh, Francis Glessner Lee actually recommended him for the job here in Maryland. They were friends. Um, and uh, so uh, he went to Harvard and said, you know, we'll just, how about we continue the homicide seminar in Baltimore? And they said, great, take them, they're all yours. Uh, and they came down here in 1967 and the seminar resumed here in 1968. And now it's called the Francis Glessner Lee Seminar on Homicide Investigation. Love, they have found a lovely home and they have a curator who really cares about them. I, I love to see your passion and your interest in, in these nutshells. I don't think a person could ever get tired of looking at them. Not me. There's probably something new every time you stare at them. It's true. Well, folks, I'm going to wrap up our evening here with Bruce Gold Farm. First, by saying thank you, Bruce, so much for this generous tour of the nutshell studies at the um, Chief Medical Officer's uh, Office in Maryland. That was very, very generous of your time. Very generous. Glad to do it. To do it. Great to talk with you, Katie. Uh, all my love to everybody in Kansas City. Um, we're going to get through this and. It's just so nice. I'm looking forward to coming back and hope to next time in person. And speaking of coming back, if anyone watching tonight has had their interest peaked in reading the book, we will be gathering for a book discussion on Tuesday, June 2nd. And Bruce has said he will drop in and answer any other questions. I'd love to. Yeah, that'll be great. We're going to talk about the book and then there might be other questions for you that you didn't get tonight. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. That's going to be fun. So good night, Bruce. Good night, night everyone. Night. Thank you so much. You bet.